Hi guys, this is Weasel for PokerBrainiacs.com. We are going to be discussing the concept of leveling. What is leveling and why is it relevant to us? We can say that effective poker strategy clearly has very strong roots in the areas of mathematics and statistics. It's using these that we are able to calculate the expected value of the various plays we make and hence we can deduce whether we can expect to show a profit in the long run with these plays. However, to suggest that these factors are the only important thing in constructing a winning poker strategy would be an unfortunate oversight. Psychological factors are also involved quite deeply in some cases and it's here we find the usefulness of the concept of leveling that allow us, allows us to apply these psychological factors to constructing our poker strategy to support the already existing mathematics and statistics that we hopefully have in place. Firstly, what is the difference between leveling and adjusting? The difference is that adjusting can be a purely mathematical process. Perhaps we know that the range that someone is open raising, or perhaps we know the exact range that they are three betting, and we can then begin to construct an exact range that we want to play back against that particular range. Leveling is a type of adjusting, but it has a larger basis in psychology than maths. Sometimes if we were to consider the exact ranges involved and compare different types of equity of those ranges, we'd find that maths may tell us to do one thing, but when we consider the various psychological aspects of a particular situation, we may find that in actual fact, the best option to take is going to be the one that's opposite from what the maths might suggest. And this would of course be as a result of thinking on a various level. But what exactly is the definition of leveling? Leveling involves a concept that exists in two minds, a concept that exists in the minds of two players, or more specifically, one mind is aware of a concept that exists in another mind in another's mind. Perhaps you know that your opponent knows a particular piece of strategy about the game. Perhaps you know your opponent knows that dry boards are good boards to see bet. Or perhaps you know that your opponent knows that against your open raising range it's going to be profitable to put in a decent amount of light three bets. Or perhaps you know that your opponent knows about polarizing his three bet ranges. Or perhaps you know that your opponent doesn't know about polarizing his three, range, his three bet ranges. Leveling is a way of exploiting your opponent's strategy depending on what you know about the strategy that is already inside your opponent's mind. If you know he knows something about a particular poker concept, you can then exploit that information. It's important, however, to distinguish the subtle difference between thinking on a level and leveling or leveling wars. Thinking on a level is something we do where yes we are perhaps aware of how our opponent thinks about the game but we then make the appropriate adjustment to our opponent's game and probably nothing will happen after that. Once that adjustment is in place Perhaps you start 3-betting against someone who's falling to 3-bets a lot. And once that adjustment is in place and you are successfully stealing from your opponent, that's perhaps going to be it. Your opponent is not going to start finding another way to balance his ranges and play back at you. That adjustment is just going to stay there and you are going to continually steal your opponent's money. Leveling or leveling wars, on the other hand, it kind of implies that your opponent is trying just as hard to think on the next level than you and once you make an adjustment to your opponent he is also going to be adjusting to your adjustments and in some cases when deep leveling gets involved the idea of 
preempting someone's adjustment and perhaps adjusting before they've even adjusted. So one thinking on a level is perhaps a basic process where we are just going to want to be playing on the next level of our opponent and then leveling stroke leveling wars which implies a much deeper battle much deeper psychological battle where both players are trying their hardest to end up on the most profitable level compared to their opponents let's look at the more basic side thinking on a level and what do we mean by this what are the basic levels we can perhaps assign the different player types a specific level level 0 these players aren't thinking about anything at all they are perhaps your typical gambler types they don't even necessarily realize poker is a game of skill they've come to the casino for a particular reason and that reason is just to gamble and in their minds there's nothing that they can really do to give themselves an edge in the game of poker they may as well just shove any two cards at any point they're not thinking at all about making the best hand because in their minds it's all gambling anyway so what's the point of trying to employ some type of strategy on the next level we have our level one thinkers and these are the players that understand basic strategy they are taking their strong hands and they are betting them or raising them and when they miss the flop and they have a weak hand they are going to be checking or they are going to be folding these players may be employing a very basic strategy but when you put them up against a level zero player who is not really thinking about the game at all the players on the slightly higher level level one are generally going to do pretty well against the players on level zero Next we have the players on level 2 and these players understand how the level 1 player thinks, they understand what the level 1 player is trying to do and as a result they can get out of the way when a level 1 player is value betting and when they think that level 1 player is weak they are going to look for opportunities to steal the pot. In general the level 2 players are going to do very well against the level 1 players and assuming that they can recognize that a player is a level 0 player they should also do very well against the level 0 players but as we will go on to see if they can't recognize correctly that a player is playing on level 0 a level 2 player may put himself in a situation where he is leveling himself into making the wrong plays some of the time and ironically may end up doing better against a level 1 player than against a level 0 player However, assuming that a level 2 player is competent and can recognize and distinguish between both level 1 and level 0 players, there's no reason why a level 2 player couldn't play profitably against both level 1 and level 0 players. Then we have the top level that we are going to consider for the sake of this theory video, and that's level 3. And these players are masters of the level 2 style and as a result they know how to exploit it. Perhaps for example they see a level 2 player and this level 2 player he knows that perhaps he can 3 bet light against a level 1 player for example but the level 3 play, player is sitting there waiting to put in a cold 4 bet because he recognizes that the level 2 player is trying to exploit the level 1 player and, and assuming that these level 3 players are capable of recognizing the players on the other three levels they should be able to play profitably against them all but the same situation applies assuming that a level 3 player has trouble or incorrectly identifies one of the players on one of the other levels again they run the risk of putting themselves in a situation where they end up leveling themselves into making the wrong decision What exactly do we mean by leveling yourself? Or perhaps there's another term we can use for that and it's called fancy play syndrome. Leveling yourself is where you end up giving your opponent too much credit, or perhaps not enough, but a lot of the time too much credit for thinking on a certain level and as a result you end up making the wrong play. 
for example, we've seen that the level 2 players that we were discussing typically can exploit the level 1 players because they recognize when the level 1 players are value betting and they recognize when the level 1 players are weak. Supposing one of the level 0 players comes along and he's not really thinking about the game and he ends up playing against a level 2 player and the level 2 player perhaps, let's say he incorrectly identifies this level 0 player and he thinks he's a level 1 player and this level 0 player begins betting in a spot where a level 1 player would only ever be betting for value. As a result the level 2 player may in fact make the wrong decision and decide to fold and it would be the correct play against a player that's playing on level 1 but against a player that's playing on level 0 it may in fact be completely the wrong play and as a result you could perhaps say that he leveled himself into perhaps giving his opponent more credit um, for betting in a spot where he would normally only have a value hand when in fact his opponent was not even thinking on that level at all his opponent was a level 0 player and he was just betting because betting is fun and the same pretty much would apply perhaps you can think of a situation where a level 3 player ends up playing against a level 1 player and he assumes that that player is perhaps a level 2 player and perhaps that level 2 player or that level 1 player who is suspected to be a level 2 player begins betting big in a spot where a level 2 player might conceivably choose to bluff but a level 1 player is much less likely to bluff because all his goal is to do is to make strong hands and to bet those hands and then check fold his weak hands but this level 3 player who perhaps incorrectly identifies this level 1 player as being a level 2 player he thinks to himself well this is a standard spot that a level 2 player would be bluffing I'm going to call my bluff catcher when in actual fact he was giving this level 1 player credit for bluffing in a spot where in actual fact he would never bluff because he's only a level 1 player and not a level 2 player. Again, by thinking on the wrong level, this level 3 player, or by, th by giving his opponent too much credit, in this case for bluffing in a spot where it may be a good spot to bluff, but by giving his opponent credit for recognizing that that was a good spot to bluff, this level 3 player has ended up leveling himself and making the wrong decision. And just as we've considered, this may occur when a level 2 player or a player plays level 2 versus a level 0 player or a player plays level 3 versus a level 1 player. So we are saying these players are a certain level but they can also play a certain level. So the way a level 3 player exploits a level 1 player is by playing on level 2. And the way a level 2 player exploits a level 0 player is by playing on level 1. Fancy play syndrome is really just a compounded version of leveling yourself, which can extend across a variety of different situations. And perhaps you're even sitting there coming up with very deep psychological reasons for all your play, and it sounds like it's very good. But in reality, you're just spewing money because you are just constantly giving your opponents credit for thinking on a level that they're not thinking on, that they're just not thinking about the game as deeply as you give them credit for. And the main problem is, often thinking on the wrong level will involve you doing the exact opposite of what is profitable. So, for example, perhaps a player is betting in a spot where it seems like he can only be betting for value but you think to yourself well this is a spot where my opponent can only be betting for value and perhaps he knows that so therefore this is a good spot for him to be betting as a bluff and then you end up calling in a situation where in actual reality your opponent can only ever have a value hand but you've just managed to level yourself into making the complete opposite of what is going to be the most profitable play we are going to consider a few common levelling situations and there are, are of course a huge number of potential situations where levelling is involved. Pretty much any situation can involve levelling to an extent. 
We are going to consider a few that perhaps may come up slightly more often than others. One is going to be the idea of betting or raising or three betting on a dry board. Let's suppose we have player A in the cutoff and he open raises and player B on the button he calls in position and the flop comes a king 8 to rainbow board. So a very dry board. And typically, a lot of you may know that these are considered good boards to see bet. But let's assume that player B, who is on the button in position, he knows that this is a good board to see bet. And what's more, he knows that player A, who open raised, knows this is a good board to see bet. For player A, the expected value of see betting as a bluff is now going to go down because player B is sitting there expecting player A to be c-betting this board with his entire range. One thing that might happen as a result is player B, knowing that player A is c-betting his entire range, more or less, is going to perhaps start floating. And as a result, player A, perhaps player A, even knows that player B knows that he is going to be c-betting this board with entire, his entire range. And as a result, player A realises that in order for this to be profitable, he may need to fire two barrels on a board that may not typically be a good board to fire two barrels on. For example, I don't typically recommend people fire two barrels on a king high drive board because normally when your opponent calls on such a board, it's going to represent a decent amount of strength. There aren't too many draws your opponent can have. Whereas if your opponent knows that you're c-betting this board with your entire range, then there suddenly become a lot more hands your opponent can conceivably call on this board in position because your opponent can pretty much call with anything. He can call with 10-jack, he can call with ace-10, he can call with pocket pocket threes. He can pretty much call with any hand where his intention is to take that pot away from you on the turn when you check. As a result, as a result of the levels involved, you may realise that against some opponents, these are either not so good boards to see bet, or they're boards where you are going to need to fire a second barrel in order for it to be profitable. That's just one scenario though. What if your opponent, who knows that your C betting range is going to be very wide, decides to put in a bluff raise? And this is in fact a very interesting situation if your opponent were to decide that he wants to bluff raise on a king high drive board. And the reason is it doesn't actually make sense with any of his strong made hands. It doesn't make sense to raise a hand like pocket twos, pocket eights, pocket kings or ace king on this board. As a result, when someone does raise this board, it actually ends up looking very bluffy. It's going to be a lot higher EV to flat strong made hands in position and let your opponent fire multiple barrels on such a board. However, let's assume that you are player B and you are the one who has a bluff and you decide to bluff raise this board. Assuming that you knew your opponent didn't realise that you are in actual fact not really representing many value hands by raising this board. Assuming either that your opponent didn't know this or perhaps your opponent isn't aware that you know this. For example, your opponent doesn't realise you are good enough to realise that raising ace king or raising pocket eights on such a board doesn't make any sense. If either of these two are true then you can potentially raise this board as a bluff because you know your opponent is going to be c-betting this board very wide, it's a good board to c-bet. And assuming that you are both on the correct level, it can in fact be profitable to bluff raise in this particular situation. However, let's assume that we go one level deeper and you are the one doing the raising, but your opponent realises how you are perceiving his range and perhaps he also realises that you know that it's not a good idea to raise a hand like ace king or pocket eight or pocket twos on this board. Then raising this board as a bluff may in fact be a very bad idea because Given that you are representing no value hands, your opponent can theoretically 3-bet this board a very high proportion of the time and fold you off any of your bluffs. 
Which brings about another interesting situation. Perhaps some of you are familiar with the Yeti theorem. And the Yeti theorem states that a three bet on a dry board is very often going to be a bluff. Because if we assume player A C bets his dry board, player B decides to raise in position as a bluff, and player A, when facing this raise, player A himself, if he did have a hand like kings, eights, or deuces, or ace king, the same applies to player A. It doesn't really make much sense for him to three bet these hands. It makes a lot more sense to hope that player B is bluff raising and for player A to flat these hands to a raise. Now if you realized your opponent who is in position on you knew that three bets typically looked more bluffy than flatting out of position, then you could in fact decide to three bet a strong made hand for value. And the same applies if you are the one in position facing a flop C bet. If you know that your opponent expects you to be very bluffy when you make a raise on a king 8 2 board, you could in fact start taking hands like ace king, pocket 8s, and pocket 2s, and raising them for value in a spot where your opponent basically perceives you to be polarized, but not just polarized, but also weighted towards bluffs. In fact, pretty much having zero value combinations. And this would, of course, be very profitable for you to have a hand like ace king where your opponent pretty much perceives your entire range to be bluffs. Hopefully we can see that even just from this one example of raising on a dry board that the plays may or may not be correct. For example, sometimes raising ace-king in position is going to be an absolutely terrible play, whereas other times it may even be a good play. It really all depends on the levels involved. Sometimes raising this board as a bluff is going to be a very bad play. If your opponent is perceptive, he can 3-bet over your flop raise after he knows that your flop raising range is pretty much purely consisting of bluffs. But if, you're, if you and your opponent are on the level or on a slightly different level, then you can in fact get away with bluff raising this board especially given that it's a dry board, there aren't many combinations of hands your opponent can have. And also given the fact that on such a board your opponent is quite possibly going to be c-betting more or less his entire range. Let's consider another common leveling situation and it involves 3-betting in succession. The way this works is perhaps you are on the button, or perhaps perhaps your opponent is on the button and you're in the small blind, and your opponent open raises on the button and you put in a three bet as a bluff and your opponent folds. Then the very next hand, your opponent who is now in the cutoff open raises and again you put in a three bet. And the level involved here is the majority of players on facing a second three bet in a row will actually end up giving you credit a lot of time for having a strong made hand. The natural tendency when you 3-bet someone a second time in a row is to get the feeling that it seems like you are going to get played back at. You just 3-bet someone, you 3-bet three, three bet them again, it feels like you are going to be played back a lot. Your opponent who is sitting there facing that second 3-bet in a row quite possibly knows that you know this. and as a result, he is going to give you credit for having a value hand a large amount of the time because really by three betting twice in a row you are kind of asking to be played back at and as a result they just assume, or the majority of opponents will assume that when you three bet twice in a row the second time you have a strong value hand. And this doesn't even just have to be two three bets in a row. Perhaps you decide to 3-bet someone a third time in a row. And some players will literally just sit there thinking, wow, this guy's 3-bet three, three me three times in a row. He's got to have it this time. No one, no one would be stupid enough to just 3-bet me as a bluff three times in a row. He has to have a hand this time. And you can get away with just doing that to people if they are thinking on the correct level. Because, of course, some people will 
perhaps not even be thinking on a level, perhaps not even aware of some of the psychological issues involved. And the instant they see that second three bet in a row, they'll think to themselves, well, this guy's just three bet me before. He must be three betting light again. I'll four bet this time. But I do find that in general, this is a much smaller percentage of players. The key is, of course, identifying which level players are thinking on. And if you can find a player who is thinking on the level that if you do three bet multiple times in succession, they are going to give you credit for having a value hand. If you can find these players, it can often be a good strategy to three bet as a bluff in multiples of two. So when you three bet bluff someone, if assuming that another three bet opportunity comes up one or two hands later, then if you take that, you're going to have slightly more fold equity. And it can be a good strategy to do this. The third levelling situation we're going to talk about is perhaps a slightly similar one, but also subtly different. And it's the idea of three betting continuously. And this situation occurs when perhaps you are open raising and there is some guy that is just continually three betting you. And it's got to the point where you know he's three betting you light. And not only do you know he's three betting you light, but he knows that you know that he's three betting you light. As a result, the player doing the light three betting gets to the stage where he is actually anticipating you to play back. Of course, we know that when someone is 3-betting light, it can be a good strategy to put in a 4-bet bluff. In fact, mathematically, you can say that against their range, it's going to be profitable to 4-bet bluff. However, if this player that is doing the light 3-betting is on the level where he is expecting you to 4-bet light, then regardless of how your ranges line up, it's quite possibly going to be a very bad idea to put in a 4-bet as a bluff against a player that is anticipating that you are going to 4-bet as a bluff in the very near future. What happens is you find yourself in a situation where given the levels involved, perhaps you're the one open raising and getting continuously pounded by 3-bets, you are in a situation where you in actual fact have to continue folding to 3-bets and there's not really a lot you can do about it because you know that as soon as you put in a 4-bet, your opponent is going to be on the level where he was expecting you to 4-bet and he's just going to shove over the top with a bluff. And unfortunately, you put yourself in a situation where you have to wait for a value hand. However, of course, the EV of perhaps 4-betting for a thin value would then go up, assuming your opponent is on this level, because you can perhaps expect him to bluff jam with a high frequency if he's on the level where he's expecting you to 4-bet bluff against his 3-bets. One final levelling spot, and is very similar to the 3-betting in succession, is the idea, perhaps you triple barrel someone, and you show down a bluff, and then the very next hand, or perhaps a few hands later, you triple barrel that player again, that player again, and Perhaps going through their mind will be the fact that you've just shown a bluff the last time, either because you got called or you just felt like showing your hand. And people will a lot of the time give you credit for having a value hand the second time. Especially if you ended up getting called the previous time and you ended up having a bluff. People will think to themselves, Wow, this guy has just triple barreled off his stack to me with a bluff. There's no way that he is going to do it again. When in actual fact, as a result of that level involved, it can be a very good spot to triple barrel as a bluff. Immediately after you've just triple barreled as a bluff and shown somehow that it was a triple barrel bluff. If you then do it again very soon afterwards, you are going to get credit for having a value hand a huge amount of the time. Assuming people are thinking on the this particular level and I think the majority of people will be thinking on this level but as with all things there are going to be some players who are not thinking on a level or who are thinking on the wrong level or who, who are just not thinking at all and they are going to say well 
I've just seen this guy three barrel as a bluff. He's done it again. He must be bluffing. And then they snap call. Therefore, it is very useful to have some kind of idea of what level you think your opponent is thinking on, how deeply they're thinking about the game. Are they, are they competent players? But assuming you can establish what level someone is thinking on, you can exploit their tendencies using some of these particular instances. For example, perhaps three betting in multiples as a bluff, uh, perhaps triple barreling in the right spots. If you think that it's going to trigger some kind of level and it's going to end up being more profitable than the maths alone might suggest as a result of psychological factors. Just a few final pointers. It's important to understand that leveling is usually a result of history. You don't just sit down at a table with someone you've never seen before and suddenly end up getting into an intense leveling war where he knows that you know that he knows that this, this and that. Leveling is a result of history. Until you've built up that history, there is not really going to be any intense leveling going on. There may be some things you can deduce, for example, perhaps a large amount of the players at a specific limit know about a particular poker concept and as a result you can plan your strategy around the idea of you think this player knows something, perhaps you can tell by his other stats that he looks like a regular and you think as a result he may know about a specific poker concept and so you can involve yourself in some very basic levelling but the intense levelling battles that perhaps you've seen it's usually going to be a result of having a decent amount of history with your opponents and if you try and get involved in leveling wars without having any history or knowledge of your opponent you are very often going to end up just leveling yourself and making the wrong decision therefore it's very important to not go crazy remember you don't want to level yourself and you don't want to be a victim of fancy play syndrome where you're just making a huge number of crazy looking plays and you may have very intense and decent sounding psychological reasons why you are making certain plays but if they are based on levels that just don't exist inside your opponent's head then a lot of the time you may even just end up doing the opposite play to that which is the most profitable and you're just going to end up spewing money you need at least a basic reason before you make any play involving leveling and it doesn't necessarily have to be complex, but there has to be a reason. Even if it's something simple like, perhaps you notice someone has got reggie stats, they look like a regular from the other stats, and you think as a result, let's say they open under the gun, and you think that they are going to give three bets versus under the gun open raises more credit by virtue of being a regular. That's fine, you have at least some reason for why you're making a play. If if you're suddenly giving your opponents credit for thinking on all variety of levels when you don't actually know anything about them, then again you are going to end up leveling yourself. We've seen there's kind of two aspects to this. It's not difficult to learn to play the first one which is on the correct level. For example, if we know someone is just randomly shoving any two cards, we want to play level one against them, we just want to play ABC straightforward. We want to bet for value, we want to fold when we don't have a hand. And against the players that are playing level 1, we want to play level 2. We want to get out of the way when they're value betting. We want to establish when their range is weak and we perhaps find some opportunities to steal a pot from them. And the same goes for level 3 versus level 2 players. This is just the very simple aspect of leveling. This is just thinking on the correct level. And it should be something that once you have a basic idea of how someone's playing, it shouldn't be too difficult to accomplish necessarily, so long as you don't make mistakes distinguishing between the various player types and end up leveling yourself. The other aspect to leveling, the more intense side, the leveling stroke, leveling wars part of it, is something that takes a large amount of practice and experience. It's not something that you're going to learn to do overnight. And it definitely helps if you have a natural inclination towards understanding how human psychology works.
However, it is somewhat important to at least try and get to grips with how leveling wars work. Because as we saw at the outset, the mathematics stroke statistics part of playing is very important and it's a key factor in establishing the expected value of various players, but that is really just one part of the game. And in order to formulate the most effective strategy, you need to also come to grips with the psychological side of the game. I hope this has been a useful introduction to leveling and adjusting, etc., and to avoid fancy play syndrome. This has been Weasel for PokerBrainiacs.com. Thanks for watching.